Okay, so this talk is going to overlap a bit with the previous one, but in some sense will be more general and will cover larger number of observables and their interplay. So first of all, I will have to introduce again the composite Higgs. In order to not, not to break the discussion, I will have to repeat something, but with an emphasis on different things compared to the previous talk. And there, then I will discuss the principal constraints coming in composite Higgs, in particular from direct searches, uh, which are being performed currently at the LHC, and the future precision physics which can be done at lab. And I will try to understand, figure out what is more important or complementary to each other. And okay. So first of all, okay, needless to say, the composite Higgs is motivated by the uh, hierarchy problem. The Higgs being composite is not sen would not be sensitive to the whatever highest energy scales in the theory are present. Uh, in order to, set, to solve the little hierarchy problem, which is okay, well, typically present in this kind of theorems, we impo impose an additional feature of the theory, which is the Higgs uh, pseudo number Gaussian nature. If the Higgs is a approximate Gaussian boson, its mass has additional protections, additional protection and in this case can be <coughs> naturally lighter than the masses of the other composite resonances which are not observed now. Hence that's a kind of necessary condition. So these are two main ingredients of the models I'm going to discuss is the compositeness and the ghost on nature. Uh, the general picture of the theories was already described before. So we have the composite sector, which contains completely new particles with respect to what we know, apart from the Higgs. And we have the standard model, which contains all the, all we know apart from the Higgs, which is supposed to be elementary. And they interact by means of some kind of interactions. So the strong sector condenses and condenses at some scale f and produces the Higgs as a Gaussian boson. So again, whenever I will go to some particular examples, I will assume this minimal spontaneous symmetry breaking pattern in the composite sector, which is SO5 to SO4, which is optimal. In a sense, it gives uh, four Gaussian bosons, which can form a Higgs doublet, and it allows the composite sector to respect the custodial symmetry, which is approximately present in the standard model. And uh, so given that picture, the only mass scale which emerges in the theory is this uh, scale of the condensate F. So you generically expect that all the masses are determined by this scale of the condensate times the coupling of the particles to this condensate. So, for, okay, which is depicted here. Uh, which, which has some pheno obvious phenomenological problems, because in this case, the standard model Higgs would be of the same size as this strong condensate. And in phenomenological viable theories, you have to imply some additional tuning to make the Higgs wave smaller than this new strong dynamic scale. And this is a kind of unavoidable tuning in um, in a large class of models with the number goes on Higgs. Uh, currently what we have is that, so the degree of tuning can be defined like this. This is psi parameter, ratio of the two scales was introduced before. Currently, psi smaller than roughly 0.2 is okay. Um, which means that the condensate scale is around, let's say one TV and um, this parameter is, as I say, is a measure basically the mini, a measure of the minimally present tuning in, in our models. So whenever we want really to test the composite Higgs, we, in the end, we always want to constrain the Xi parameter because once it becomes too small and we don't say anything, that means that 
composite Higgs doesn't solve the hierarchy problem anymore. So now I'll turn to the Higgs mass. So of course, being a Gaussian boson, it cannot acquire any mass. So the mass should come with the breaking of the Gaussian symmetry, which comes with the coupling to the standard model. And OK, clearly, as was mentioned before, the top quark plays somehow special role in the Higgs mass generation and okay, in, in the hierarchy problem as well. In particular, in this theory, the top quark has the largest standard model coupling. And uh, it comes, OK, in any loop, it would be also counted three times because of the color factor. So in this case, the top quark introduces the largest source of Gaussian symmetry breaking and naturally is the dominant source of the Higgs mass. And OK, just the naive estimate of the Higgs mass is given here. OK, it's always the proportional to the top Yukawa. Uh, there is a remnant of the loop factor. And we see that if you want to have Higgs sufficiently light, as it is, we either need to tune to choose some very small psi, or we need to have somewhat, somewhat low scale of the <coughs> resonances saturating this Higgs potential. So these resonances obviously have to do something with the top quark, because they need somehow to cancel this loop where the top quark is running. So these are called the top partners. And they're expected to be somewhat light. So for instance, for 10% tuning, we expect them to be of the order of 0.7 TV. So that's a very rough estimate. Being a bit more precise, we can take some particular calculable model and we see that, okay, this relation can be slightly rela relaxed and um, partners can be somewhat heavier. So let's say in this case, <coughs> it would be not the 0.7, but let's say 1.7 TV. And if we don't see them at 1.7, that means that Xi should be smaller, so the model is more tuned. And, uh, okay, that's the, the minimal setup, let's say. There are, let's say, more clever models where these top partners are hiding, are hidden by, by some kind of uh, additional symmetries and additional assumptions. Okay, so for instance, twin Higgs models where the new degrees of freedom which are needed to cancel the divergences actually are not colored under the standard model color. In that case, we expect that <coughs> this relation is even more relaxed. Okay, of course, in any case, you cannot, you expect to see something at least at the scales lower than 4 pi f, this is the general generic ex expectation for a strong dynamics, let's say. I think normally in twin Higgs you have something like a half of this. But. <coughs> so that was something about mass spectrum of the composite resonances. Let's go to the Higgs couplings and in the composite Higgs models, given the fact that Higgs is a composite, is a number Gaussian boson, not, not only in the composite Higgs models, but where the Higgs is a Gaussian bo is realized as a Gaussian boson, it is convenient to describe the theory not in terms of the Higgs doublet field, but in terms of the so-called Gaussian matrix where the Higgs enters as exponential. In this case, whenever you would have, let's say, this, the, just the Higgs doublet and the standard model in some operator or whatever, in the NGB theory, you, you have instead a set of terms whose coefficients are fixed because they come from the exponential, which introduces obviously new interactions and modifies the interactions with, the standard, with respect to the standard model. As an example, just the Higgs, dub, Higgs vector vector, for instance, Higgs WW coupling gets modified by factor of Xi. So what is important is that this modification is not suppressed by the scale of the lightest composite resonances. 
in a sense. In a weekly coupled theory, you, you would expect that all the new corrections would come with the, would come suppressed by the scale of new masses. The, the point of the strongly coupled theories is that, okay, the strong coupling itself, which would also generically intervene in these new operators, can <coughs> be large, cancels large masses, and in the end, the suppression is not that large. So assuming that even you have the new composite states at two, three TVs, the separation for a natural theory would be just, let's say, around one TV because of this. So this is, in principle, a generic thing for strongly coupled theories. In, composite, in the case of the Goldstone composite composite Higgs, there, uh, there are some additional restrictions. You just come from the Goldstone image. So in generic case, you would not be able to fix these coefficients in this set while the <coughs> imposing some ghost on symmetry gives you pretty unambiguous values of these coefficients. So if you see something, <coughs> you can try to match the patterns which you expect for, from some particular uh, PNGB model and try to see where it, whether it works or not. Another source of distortions of the couplings in this kind of, kind of models is the partial compositeness. <clears throat> so as I said, I need to couple the standard model to the composite sector. And okay, this is done by linear mixings. And then the observed standard model mass eigenstates are composite, partially composite. And uh, <clears throat> so this degree of compositeness Okay, first of all, it defines how massive they are. Second of all, it mixes, for instance, the particle with different quantum numbers. So, obviously this would distort, for instance, couplings of the fermions to the vector bosons, and so on. And naturally, given that the top is the most massive, it is expected to be the most composite and you expect the largest modifications of the couplings in the top sector. So that was introduction. We come first to the direct observation of the possible composite resonances. Okay, they are colored. Okay, in this hour, in our minimal setup. So you can produce them abundantly in the LHT in pairs or the or due to the single production, given the fact that they mix with the standard model quarks. And, okay, just very briefly, <coughs> some projections for LHC 13. You expect to exclude the partners with masses, let's say, up to 1.7 TV. Maybe slightly more, but this, is, this becomes a model-dependent model exclusion. So you, you can be sure that you will be at least at least here. At 100 TV collider, okay, it's much much more difficult to estimate, but okay, based on some very approximate reason, we can assume that the okay there was then an approximate analysis, let's say, and uh, the estimate would be around 10 TV, uh, the exclusion for the top partners. We can compare this with our arguments about the fixed mass lightness and the need for light top partners. <coughs> so that's <coughs> the scale of the lightest uh, top, top partner, which is supposed to play, in, play <coughs> the role in the cancellation of the Higgs potential. And this is one over xi, which is the measure of the tuning of our model. So the, mo the larger it is, the more model is tuned. So this line is expected in the most na naive, let's say, models, in the easiest models where the top partners are maximally light. And then you can, they, they can become heavier, meaning that it is more difficult to okay, constrain them. Currently with the LHC, okay, with the future LHC run, we'll be able to cover this 
part of the parameter space, which means that for the easiest models, so let's say for the simplest ones, we will come to the tuning of the order of 1% or let's say 5%. For slightly, okay. Using slightly less naive estimates based on some concrete models. In fact, you see that uh, you just come to the tuning of the order of 10% with the LHC. And with things with hidden uh, top partners or something like that, you basically, okay, you're not constrained. <coughs> Instead, with the next generation colliders, you can go, you can do much better and go below one, yeah, much below 1%. Okay, depending on the model, but okay, of course, that's not the close perspective. <coughs> now, given that, it is interesting to compare this reach on the natural scale given by the direct searches with the one which can come from the precision physics. So, in the following, I will assume that the LHC 13 has passed. Uh, we haven't observed anything definite there. So the possible questions which one might ask is whether TLAB after that can, see, can actually be able to see something. Uh, and the second one is obviously if it doesn't see anything, what is the limit on the models which, which we can put. So we'll start with the electric precision tests. Okay, in this way we can test the new physics and the self-energies of the gauge bosons. And at TLAB we expect a okay, factor of 10 improvements with respect to the current bounds. So these are S and T parameters. These are current, more or less. This is TLAB after all the runs. And the composite Higgs models, there are, this already was already discussed before. There are several contrib possible contributions to these parameters. There are most universal ones which come from the modification of the Higgs couplings to the vector bosons, which are least model dependent. And in principle, they give quite sizable correction to the T parameter, the negative one. On top of that, we, can, we have some contribution from the UV physics, which was actually this for instance, from the vector bosons, which was extensively discussed in the previous case. Now, we just assume that they, all this physics lies above our cutoff and just give a very simple estimate of it, use a simple estimate of it. On top of that, there are the contributions of the fermions, and they, they can be large both for T parameter and for S parameter. In particular, so that's a plot for S and T. In the model with one fourplet and one singlet of the S of four, the fermionic colored partners. Uh, I will assume that they are heavier than 1.7, so they, are, they were not seen at the LHC. <coughs> so I, I assume that psi, that the tuning is around 5%, which is compatible with partners heavier than this. So, at the same time, it's not dramatic. Let's say 5% is not that far from 10%. So that's still, let's say, a viable model in the sense of uh, naturalness. And OK, so this is the plot. Uh, this is the current bound. This is the expectation for TLAB precision. Not obviously it will be centered here. And the green points is what I can reproduce with this model. And I can, I can be whenever, I mean, I can be in any place which is allowed now by, by current data. <clears throat> which means, of course, that if I see some deviations and, uh, okay, for instance, the, the central fit would be somewhere here, I will be able to reproduce it with this model. And I will be able to tell something about the spectrum of the model. For instance, okay, the coupling between fourplet and singlet Okay, increases like this. The fourplet is expected to be heavier here. The, the singlet is going to be heavier here. So once I see some deviation, I can tell you something about the spectrum of the model. 
if I don't see any deviation, <coughs> in, in this small, so let's say the central value is here, the green points are also do cover this part of the parameter space. Does it mean that <coughs> even with this moderate tuning, I can fit any non-observation non in the S and P? Okay, one can say that yes, because okay, there are green points here, close to zero. But the relevant question is uh, how tuned are the different contribution to the S and P parameter needed to actually pass to, to get into this point. So we can make this estimate based on the largest contribution to the P parameter, just requiring that, uh, so we want to, okay, so we know that S and P get different contributions from un unrelated sectors. So as I said, the fermionic ones, the Higgs, the composite vectors, it's not likely that they will cancel very precisely. So the estimate of the natural cancellation in this case would be that the precision, that, so I assume that the central fit value is zero and the contribution generated by the largest, the largest contribution is not much greater than the precision I have from my measurements. If the contribution is much greater, but in the end it cancel, cancels against something unrelated to it with a very large precision, this in some sense unnatural. So I'm going to estimate this kind of tuning. And here's the plot. There is a precision I have on the T parameter, and that's my psi. So if I don't see anything, let's say, at, uh, okay. At T lab, let's say there is a 10%, uh, 10 times improvement. That means that if I don't want to have some extreme tuning in S and T, I cannot have it. I cannot have xi larger. I cannot have xi smaller than let's say one uh, one percent. Okay, 10 to the minus two. So in any case, if I don't see something, I still put some limits on the naturalness. Okay, that was it with the electric precision test. The next is uh, the Higgs couplings. So some of them are generated in the standard model at the tree level, others at, at loop level, the same in composite Higgs. And uh, so that, that's a list of some of the relevant ones, Higgs to the vectors, uh, to the electroweak vectors, W and Z. Higgs to the fermions and gluons. Okay, you, you also have gamma gamma, but okay, the expression is slightly more involved and the precision is less. So that's the precision expected at the, at the FCC. And uh, okay, the precision translated into the bound on Xi is uh, very strong. What is very important about <coughs> coupling to the vectors is that it is extremely model independent. So once you say to me that the Higgs is number Gaussian boson, just it's pretty automatically follows the, the, the precise form of the deviation you have. So once you, you, it's really hard to tune some model parameters to escape this deviation to make it smaller apart from, tune, uh, apart from decreasing the Xi. So if you don't see anything, that really means that the, that really tests the compositeness scale and the naturalness in a sense directly. There are the other, con the other the modifications, the couplings to fermions, the Higgs glue glue, are also just dependent, they're almost independent in the minimal case on the particular parameters of the models, apart from the Xi, but the exact form of this dependence on Xi actually depends on the symmetry structure of the model. So with measurement, measurement of this, if I see something, I can tell you something about the structure of the model, about the quantum numbers of the new states which are present in the model. Okay, so. 
next uh, couplings which are present in the sterile model and are going to be modified in the composite Higgs case <coughs> are the ones between fermions and vectors. And uh, in this case, these modifications are much more model dependent. And this, this is because of this okay, partial compositeness. As I said, the, this is the third generation of the standard model fermions is expected to mix, be mixed with composite states. And this degree of uh, mixing modifies uh, couplings to the vectors. So once you see some modification, you can, oh, yeah, I'm close. Once you, you see some modification, you can not only uh, tell something about the degree of comp the compositeness scale, but also about particular values of the parameters you have. So, okay, okay, probably I'll skip this. So this is just to tell to tell you that okay, once you see something, let's say you see some deviation in the VT, delta VTB coupling, which is important because okay. For instance, now VTB is very mildly constrained, almost unconstrained, and not really, not really relevant for constraints on composite Higgs, because, okay, it's measured on the Hadron Collider. At TLAP, it can become really precise and really rele relevant constraint on the model. And here is a superposition of the electric precision test constraints and possible deviations of the VTB couplings to the W. And you see, okay, depending on the deviation you have, you observe or not observe, you can, okay, prefer one or another model parameters. Okay, that was it. And now that's a summary of two kinds of constraints that I described above. So as I said, first of all, what is very important about the precision constraints, in particular the ones of the Higgs the uh, constraints on the couplings of, of the Higgs to the vectors is that they, direction, they directly put the constraint on the degree of uh, on the compositeness scale, meaning that they directly bound your naturalness, naturalness of your model, independently on how clever you hide your color partners and, and so on, which is in contrast with, with the, let's say, LHC or FCC, which can okay, be built in future. And we see that with the lab, we will be able to, to test the, oh, okay, these models up to 1% or maybe even stronger tuning, which probably for someone would mean that would be just the ultimate test of these kind of models. So to conclude, TLAP is uh, particularly sensitive to the very nature of the composite Higgs and probably can be the ultimate tester of it. And even apart from that, it also, if there is a certain excess of the signal observed, it can also give very valuable information about the details of the models. Okay, if they are observed, of course. And, well, that's it. Thank you. The <coughs> compositex. So the, the last page that you showed is, is, is the, the last page is uh, supposed to contain everything, right? Is that right or not? Yeah. Uh, everything order of magnitude. Yeah. I see. And I think that um, is understandable. Yes, and then uh, and then um, I mean you 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 are thinking of uh, lines, um, diagonal lines there, uh, which depends on where you want to put the resonance. And, uh, yes. Yes. Okay. yes. So that's let's say the usual simple composite Higgs is somewhere here. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. 
I have to make a similar question or remark like after the previous talk. When you take this super high precision of the S and T parameters, for example, and then you compare it to the deviation that you find there at the one loop level, of course, this assumes that everything else is small and negligible, and I'm sure this is not the case. So this draws a completely overly optimistic picture of what you can say now. And I'm not sure how this will be improved in the future. Yeah? Of course, if everything in the end is calculated with a sufficient precision, then you might get there. But presenting it like this, in my opinion, gives an overly optimistic uh, view. This also concerns the Higgs analysis that's, that was presented later. Yeah. OK, so I, I can comment a bit. So OK, it's indeed true that okay, in this kind of models, you cannot do very extremely precise physics, but for instance, you can be, uh, you can be sure that you, your not orders of magnitude for sure below, uh, I mean, out of your bounds, and th this gives you some, that already puts a lot of, con actually does put a lot of constraints on the structure of your models. The, the fact, the very fact that I use SO5 to SO4 to, for instance, to have the custodial symmetry somewhere inside, if I didn't use it, I would be totally out of the of any possible constraints. Once I do this, this gives me very important constraints on the model building that tells me what kind of particles to search for in the at the LHC, for instance. The same, for instance, the constraints on ZBB. That's I mean, uh, for instance, the fact that uh, now the, there are ongoing searches for charge five third states at the <coughs> LHC. They precisely follow from the fact that there is not from some numerical kinds coincidences of something, but they follow from the structural way to suppress certain deviations in certain observables, which allows you for order of magnitude suppression. So I don't know. If it's I can comment on Sven's comment. I think, uh, for one thing, we have more than S and T. We have also, for instance, the B partial S. We have uh, uh, heavy flavor observables, etc. And the more of them you accumulate, the more uh, you get a, um, you know, first of all, more information on what can be hidden behind the discrepancy, but also uh, the more chance of seeing a discrepancy if there is something that actually creates it. It's also more chance to see a discrepancy just by luck, but that's another story. Uh, so what I want to say is that if you see a discrepancy, it tells you there is something. If you see nothing, that doesn't tell you there is nothing. Okay, But clearly, if you see something, then you have discovered that there is something. Yes, but this is independent of this calculation. This is independent of the calculation. Oh, yeah. This, for example, may be possible in the future or may not. I don't know, depending on the precision of the calculation. Ah, the precision of calculation is absolutely essential. We agree on that. <laughs> I, mean, I don't think it makes so much sense to push the precision of the new physics calculation here. It's like uh, a pie on Lagrangian. I mean, uh, there's a certain uncertainty which is inherent and but that you have to be aware of. I mean, you have a cutoff dependence and, and all these things. Yeah, no, we're, we're not doing arbitrary things. We're also estimating all the kinds of the, I don't know, UV effects, everything that we are not. Excuse me. I think that uh, that picture is that, you know, there's they sense in that picture. You, you should not, uh, I mean, uh, you can criticize it if you think that there is another effect given the model that he has overlooked, which is more important, right? And he claims that there isn't, right? So um, in a given model, and given the uncertainty, so that's right, I mean, uh, the, 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 the calculations are not as precise as in the standard model because the model is not as well defined, but the logic behind that plot is that 
he has used what he thinks are the most important effects. What's the problem, right? The logic is perfect, I think. I think it's okay. It's the leading effects. For such a thought, yes. yes. All right. Let's thank Alexei again.